welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to tonight's Citizens Climate University. It's a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobby that provides supporters like you and I with in-depth training opportunities and access to topics relating to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Cease. There's no doubt that all of our inboxes have become perpetually overflowing mountains of irritation. And instead of helping us be more productive, they really seem just to suck hours out of each of our days. So what's the secret to managing our inboxes while staying sane? Well, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure that out with the last couple of weeks. And while we're still working on achieving that ourselves, or at least I am still seeking email nirvana, I have identified a couple of formulas and tools and tricks that I'd love to pass on tonight. And uh, with this, I'd also love to just acknowledge everyone that did help me out throughout the last couple of weeks. A lot of different CCL staffers, including uh, this long list of CCL supporters and leaders throughout the country, uh, uh, in addition to many of the articles that we'll be citing later tonight. Uh, again, I just want to acknowledge that I am by no means an expert on this as well, but if you walk away from tonight's webinar and you started here, and you end a little bit closer to here, that's my goal. I really wanna make sure that we're actually moving towards that uh, responsive, productive, supportive type of feel. And so for the agenda tonight, it's gonna to be pretty straightforward. We'll have a little bit of background. We'll have a chance to rethink our inboxes as well as review some structures for keeping them organized. We'll talk about some great tools out there and then apply it all to CCL if we haven't already throughout the webinar. So without further ado, let's just jump right in. A study actually that Adobe did several years ago put out a big feeler for what the average amount of time people spend each day dealing with emails. And this is the staggering number that they found from over 400 survey participants that, uh, that responded. And that is the average. Uh, half of those hours on average come from work. So about three or so, a little over to, uh, each day from work emails and the other half personally. And I guess I'd like to ask uh, each of us to think about what that might actually mean for CCL. Is that work? Is that personal? You get to make the call. And on top of that, the survey also identified some really fascinating things. 50% of the surveyed admitted to checking emails while resting already in bed or on vacation. 42% said they checked emails while in the bathroom. I think that was particularly the millennial segment. And then 18% even admitted that they did it while driving. So if you are one of those, um, know that you are not alone, sadly, but you should probably rethink your strategy and the healthy boundaries that you set up regarding emails. Just one last other uh, background detail that I think is really a helpful context for tonight. Out of the whole worldwide use of email, we now have approached almost 4 billion users, and that number of users sends approximately 269 billion emails every day. <laughs> on top of that, uh, what we'll really kind of key on tonight with our focus is that that 1 billion mark, it's almost approaching 1.2 now, uh, has been captured by Gmail users. So there's a lot of users out there, there's a lot of emails being sent, and a great majority of them are actually using the Google products uh, that we'll be basing a lot of tonight's discussion on. There's a lot of other wonderful email services out there, and especially tonight if you came hoping uh, for a bit more specific advice on Outlook or Yahoo, iCloud, Mail.com, AOL, Zoho, ProtonMail, you name it maybe your local service provider. I'm, I'm trying to personalize this so that they can still apply to you, uh, but the baseline template of what we're gonna be talking about is largely focused on Gmail. And that's for a couple of reasons, one of which is you know they have a wonderful storage program, so this is maybe a little nudge to try it out if you haven't already. The other thing is that Google Drive and all of the G Suite tools like slides and documents and calendar, you name it, all of that interfaces wonderfully with Gmail. And as we transition to a new community platform, we're gonna be relying more on the Google Drive suite of uh, applications as well. So it will work quite well with your interactions in CCL. 
Message threads are stacked. That's a wonderful feature. So they're not just always alone, but you can see the ongoing thread back again. Messages can automatically be filtered and searched. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. They've got a wonderful user support system and they have a wonderful lab system where uh, developers are testing out other features and tools. They have features already, uh, especially with the newer rollout this year where you can snooze emails, you can pause your inbox, you can undo sending an email if you enable any of these. Uh, a lot of the people that uh, reached out uh, back to my input spoke about the virtues of using Inbox even, a different feature or layout for Gmail users. And so if you'd like to know any more details about any, any of these, uh, the call notes will have resources to Google support to help you get through them. But that's really the rationale behind why we'll be discussing Gmail. And I'd just like to start, I guess, then transitioning from background to a little bit more about rethinking strategies. And I'd like to invite anyone on the call tonight to, to I guess, raise your hand or uh, indicate in the chat window if you at uh, one point have tried out Inbox Zero. It, it's uh, just past its 10 year mark as an idea. And uh, you know, Inbox Zero was popularized by a um, developer by the name of Merlin Mann but really the idea behind it was that we should always strive to have no emails in our inbox. And if we ever had anything, even in a draft or one that was still waiting to respond back to, we should whip ourselves and start the inbox shaming because we weren't productive. And what I'd like to, I guess, really challenge us more than anything tonight is thinking about if that's a healthy expectation. I don't think it is, and I just want to be one voice, at least in your life, saying it's all right if you do not have inbox zero now or any time in the future. And um, you know, one thing that I think the simplest way of really approaching how to really go about handling a new approach to your inbox management, and if we had to boil it down into a simple three approach step. Those would just be simply having the chance to archive immediate incoming ones, responding then and there, or deferring. I'm guessing that this is an approach in some ways that many people are already managing, um, but the general theme from those that responded back to our input on this really is to think about this as a way of liberating yourself. So if an email comes in and requires no action on your behalf, archive it immediately. If a message requires a simple reply that you can knock out in a minute or less, respond to it right then and there, and then archive it immediately. And if uh, a message requires some kind of uh, heavier level of thought or response that you can't get to right away, we'll go over a couple of tools that you can have where you could either snooze it or defer it again. You can create your own system. There isn't a specific best approach, right? It's just what works for you best. Uh, but that way, as long as you're keeping it, uh, you can make sure to get to it someday but return to you when you do have a scheduled block of response time. One of the other things that I'd like to really emphasize is a new approach of thinking about emails like messaging. Uh, like you might just send a text, if you will, because being concise saves everyone time. And we've all had emails that take a very long time to read. And, you know, again, Aunt Bertha type scenarios are wonderful. And if that's the main way you communicate with your great aunt, uh, then keep that habit going. Uh, but otherwise, here's a couple of other additional thoughts on ways to really handle emails as messages. A couple of the responses included thinking about uh, framing it as five sentences or, or less. Uh, I know that this is misspelled here, but it's actually a URL if you've never heard of five sentences. It's a wonderful website you can reference even in your signature line that talks about, you know, especially if you're worried about coming across rude, why it's important uh, as emails take too long to respond to often to create a solution in treating them like text messages and really focusing on concise responses. Uh, it doesn't have to be boorish, you know, heck, even with five sentences, you can fit in time for a quick hope you're well opening even in there. And the, the secret, I think, thinking behind uh, emails as messaging is that if you think about composing any email as if it were a text, you can again make it more formal and in presentries it's, uh, as it's appropriate. But aside from saving yourself time and letting you plow through your own, your own incoming emails more efficiently, it also adds another bonus. It'll make your outgoing emails more effective because it'll be making it easier for the recipient to read your message, understand what you want, and then fire off a similarly 
succinct reply. We're role modeling here, right? So it's not a hard and fast rule again, uh, but there's a great uh, couple of stories actually about uh, emailing like a boss, if you will. Um, and uh, some of the journalists that have experimented with that, I'll actually even just put that in the chat window right now, and uh, what kind of uh, people learn by practicing this approach. Uh, I also love that phrase, respond, don't mold. Again, sometimes deliberation is required, but uh, if you're like me, sometimes you put a little too much thought into it, and it's more effective to get out the response right then and there than it is to save it uh, for that next time when you think you'll actually have the presence of mind to know exactly what you wanted to say perfectly, right? That kind of perfectionist streak sometimes holds us back. The other uh, recommendation that came from the field that I really love is called Ohio. And it's basically just the thought that you should only be handling any of your emails once. So don't look at something uh, without having the intention of that time being able to immediately respond. You know, again, if it's uh, a late night habit before going to bed or in the bathroom, you name it anywhere else, be prepared to only really open your emails when you're in a place or a position where you can actually handle it that time as a response if needed. And then lastly, there's another uh, wonderful suggestion from the field. Uh, nobody likes having a actual URL spelled out in the email as much as they do with embedded links. So if anyone wants technical support in how you can actually include a hyperlink in your email body so that you can just click on the underscore rather than having to specifically click on that messy link path afterwards, I'd be happy to help you with that. All right, so let's move forward a little bit more and designate uh, another really helpful approach. This is probably one that uh, hopefully some of you are already trying out, but if you haven't, what I really would recommend is designated specific times each day to knock out emails like we've already talked about with the approaches we've just covered and then turn it off the rest of the day. Uh, whether that's at the very beginning of the day as you're waking up or maybe you're a really uh, sharp thinker in the morning and you actually wanna devote that project time in the morning to whatever else our priorities. Uh, most people say on average, you know, again, a, a block in the morning, a block in the afternoon works best for them. And then beyond that, it allows you to be more focused and open to the productivity that is oftentimes task switched when you're not able to focus and you're constantly toggling back and forth uh, between screens, between tabs, between alerts that are coming on. You know, if you were to set to devise the most annoying and ineffective system for email management, and this is myself, uh, guilty as charged, you'd probably come up with something where a sound or alert interrupted you every time a new message came in. And guess what? That's what automatically happens with a lot of our applications. So I think it's really important to not only uh, commit to this or to really kind of set this up strategically, but then really think through how you're not gonna be interrupted, turning off alert, uh, alerts and also then just really making sure to hold yourself accountable to that. You know, from the end result, this is really, again, trying to have a win-win goal. You'll manage your email more efficiently by tackling it in a small number of dedicated moments, and then you'll also be more focused and productive with the rest of your day without that constant barrage of interruptions and inbox-oriented messages. So if you'd like to hear about the story, it's somebody that's been uh, implementing this and fighting those constant urges, I just put that in the chat as well. All right, so let's talk about some organizational structures. And I, I love seeing a lot of the links already going on in the chat. Keep putting those in. Thanks so much, uh, Bye and Claire and everyone else for doing that. All right, so if you're anything like me, uh, less than 10% of what I would say my incoming mail is actually pertinent or you know, at least something that requires immediate response. Um, for reoccurring messages, again, this is a really wonderful approach, uh, especially if you don't want to unsubscribe, if you're you know, one that's a little bit hesitant to, or you have the fear of missing out with FOMO going on. Uh, creating filters then really automatically place them in out of the way areas in your email hierarchy. There's also a link in the um, slides on uh, the Google support behind this. And another thing that I'd love to highlight is, uh, you know, if you know emails from certain senders are never going to be relevant for you, uh, you also could consider the nuclear option. Or perhaps you're on a thread uh, that just continues to blow up in your inbox. Uh, Gmail has a feature that's called muting. And maybe you said your piece, you know, 40 years ago, but there's 30 other people on the thread and they continue to keep it relevant going for some reason. 
I, I would recommend looking into the mute feature. You can always look back and uh, search for it and see what those threads uh, are coming through on, but you're not actually having to constantly be managing out of your own inbox. And uh, at this point, the other big thing that I'd love to uh, just highlight is uh, the thing that I think oftentimes trips people up if they haven't already set up filters or if they're kind of a little bit tentative about this is they don't know how to then locate the email later. Um, perhaps you're like me as well and your memory at times is sketchier than you'd like and you can't remember the name or the date or the subject or the content of what the email was about. Um, so again, filters you can apply to specific uh, topics uh, so that you can categorize things very effectively. Uh, but what I would recommend also thinking about is uh, something within the search feature options. Let's talk about some of the frequent flyers for searches. So operators that Gmail uses and a lot of the other providers use as well include some of the following. So for example, say that you really wanna find important emails that you haven't read. Uh, say that your inbox is so full it's really hard to scan through those. Uh, based on the emails that you've opened and responded to in the past, Google can determine which messages are most important to you and even flag them with a little yellow arrow, if you haven't seen that, just to the left of the sender's name. Now to find these messages, what you would type in is just is colon important to search through those terms. If you also include is colon unread in that same query, then what would happen is that Gmail will display the important messages you have that you haven't gotten around to reading yet. That kind of makes sense. So that's a simple operative command is colon, and then you can use descriptors like important and unread. Another one, especially if you have some space wasters in your inbox, this is kind of another part of inbox management, especially if you're bumping up against that maximum limit, uh, you can search for clear out room in your account by identifying and deleting messages that are taking up the most space. Um, so including operative like has colon attachment in your query and then including this additional operative larger than 10 megabytes, you can do 100, you can do one gig, whatever you want, specifies the message size. In this case, you know, it's over 10 megabytes. And again, you can increase or decrease to pick out smaller or larger messages as needed, but it's a really helpful way to rank order space savers that you could very well just download, put on an external drive, uh, get rid of some other way. Another really helpful uh, command is by uh, using the search for really old messages or just really winnowing out you know, a specific time window. If you use the query before colon and then the date, it can either be with the dashes uh, or, or the forward slashes rather, or just simply year. Uh, you can get to older, newer messages and uh, really be able to find and clean out inbox folders or keeping it tidy. Uh, really being able to kind of find select dates, maybe even only remember that the you know emails right before the lobby day in 2017 were the ones you're looking for. You can easily use that operative to narrow your search. Then uh, you can also use that then to erase or bulk import them to a different folder if you'd like to archive them that way. Um, so uh, pinpoint messages where you were copied or blind copied. You can search CC me. Me is you in this case. You don't even have to type in your email. Google's that smart. Uh, you can also look for things like has no user labels if you want to destroy disorganization. So say that you're really scrupulous about organizing your Gmail inbox into a series of labels uh, and you want to make sure that you don't have an unassigned email. Uh, this can kind of ferret out those where you haven't categorized them before if you're a big labels fan. And then the last thing I'll just share, this is you know, Gmail specific, uh, but say you even wanted to search for things that you've chatted. Uh, you can also use the simple operative in colon chats and that will restrict your search just for that chat window. So that's really helpful. There's a lot more operatives. I put the links in the slide notes uh, that you can go through, but those are a couple of examples. So thanks for bearing with me. All right, let's keep moving on here. We're uh, over halfway already. So what are some of the alternatives to having a system in place that doesn't even rely on email? 
I think this is really kind of uh, thinking outside the box and thinking about email not as the only way to communicate people with people, right? <laughs> Before that, there was some other options out there. I would highly encourage people to think about uh, not DCCing or CCing people. Uh, one study showed that three quarters of the average 200 emails a day that workers receive are relevant to them and they're included in the CC or the BCC line. Just an important clarification too, when it says stop BCCing, that recommendation doesn't mean for any emails you're sending to groups, for example, your CCL chapter, that you should stop using the BCC line. We still wanna protect data privacy and make sure that we're not giving away emails to each other uh, that shouldn't be communicated in that to field. It's just largely incorporating people that don't need to be folded in to an email or a smaller group discussion. Uh, I'd also really encourage you to pick up the phone. Uh, if you are deferring a lot of emails, uh, chances are it's a nuanced conversation and it probably would go just as quick if you just talked to somebody. So if you're looking at that defer option, uh, you can maybe even archive the email and immediately call them and leave a message and then uh, you're, uh, you've played tag and they're in, right? Uh, the other wonderful thing that you can do is if you're noticing that you're emailing one person in particular a lot, I would encourage you just to set up a standing check-in with them if you haven't already. Uh, rather than you know, sending two, three emails a day or you know, having them copied on a lot of different information, just keep one simple list that you're gonna have as you have a standing check-in with them. And that way it really consolidates both emails and your time when you have efficient chances to have that stand up. Whether it's you know, a weekly phone call, a walking meeting, a breakfast, you name it. It'll definitely re reduce naturally your email as well. And uh, some suggestions even out there were to add to your signature line that you're available by phone. A simple, I'm trying to email less and work more, call me if you need me, is a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful signature to include rather than maybe just uh, the George Schultz quote or the uh, New York Times piece. Um, a couple of other wonderful things about systems. Uh, this is actually from uh, our executive director, Mark Reynolds, who before leaving CCL, uh, helped lead a high impact productivity firm called Mission Control. Um, he says, uh, he recommends having something called a capture tool, where, you know, and sometimes people use their email for this, uh, but I think that can often get in the way of feeling productive with your inbox. So whether it is in your drafts folder or even a written notepad, having one place where you write things down so that when you're working on something and you're thinking about all of a sudden another idea, you know, right where to go, you have a system in place to capture it and rather than changing the direction of whatever trajectory you're on, you can keep it for later and you know that you won't forget it. That capture tool is really essential. Now the next step that Mark recommends outside of having a consistent capture tool is to have a daily practice where you then transfer that list that you're developing on your capture tool to your calendar. Now reducing your list with your calendar is essential, Mark reminds us, because everything you do requires time. No surprise there, right? So using your calendar rather than your to-do list allows you to understand how much time it actually takes to get things done and really allows a more accurate gauge of these other commitments or projects that you have. It's also a wonderful tool, he reminds us, for learning when you should be saying no and what to. And then at least once a week, uh, what Mark also recommends is reviewing your calendar for a minimum of the next couple of weeks ahead so that you're not stressed out, that you feel prepared, you catch conflicts before they arise, and then also with that review, you can keep putting things on your open items list then. That's stuff that you're not getting to immediately, put anything on there that can't go into your calendar on this list, and then continuing to review that on a regular basis. If you see that there's things that you're just not ending up getting to or putting on your calendar, delete them. Thinking, you know, at least professionally wise or with your work with CCL that you should be doing them but you're not is just kidding yourself, right? And so those are a couple of additional tools, all of which don't require email, all of which can hopefully clean out your inbox outside of what we've talked about. Now just a final kind of section on some additional productivity tools and then putting this all together and then we'll go to the phones here. Let's think about some of the things that people use in the field. And again, if people have specific questions on any of these, I'm happy to field them in the Q&A or route you to the users of them afterwards. 
Um, but for some, they loved task reminder tools. For me, I just use my Google Calendar, uh, just like we talked about uh, with the prior slide, uh, to kind of have a placeholder. But other people highlighted uh, tools like Easily Do, SaneBox, Boomerang. They're all wonderful ways that you can track those defer emails that you don't either immediately archive or respond to so that they're not clogging up your inbox. So using any of those task reminder tools are wonderful additions to your flow. Another wonderful way of reducing bulk CC emails is a couple of other tools, one of which I'll actually review in just a little bit that we offer um, some support with, with MailChimp, including templates that we can provide. Um, but Gmail also just incorporated a lot of features of a program called GMAS. It's something that personalizes emails with merge fields wonderfully and very seamlessly with Google products. I use it a lot and I recommend it. It saves a lot of time. Uh, a lot of groups out there also use Google Groups. And as long as the user uh, from those groups has uh, agreed, you know, again, to being a part of that group, if they've personally signed up for them, as group leaders, we're not automatically porting their names over, uh, given privacy rights that we've um, subscribed to with the data that we have as, you know, group leaders with our chapter roster, that's great. So Google Groups are another wonderful way that you can batch emails. You don't have to have many email um, addresses all in one. You can have a daily digest format with them. And then Slack is another wonderful tool. If you haven't used it, it can be a little bit hard to jump into, um, but a lot of groups out there are using it as another way of taking messages and communication off of their inbox. Happy to go through them. One other thing uh, that I'll talk about here just really quick after talking on a high level of some of these productivity tools is something called canned responses. So if you find that you say the same thing to seven people every week, there's a tool out there for you so you don't have to type it word for word every time to seven different people. It's called Can Response, and it's a wonderful plugin that comes for free with Gmail, and I'll show you how to do that in just a little bit. And the last thing that I'm guessing, if you're like me, a lot of you deal with as well, clogging in your inbox, is requests for scheduling meetings. There's a lot of wonderful tools out there. Many people are familiar with Doodle, but there's additional tools uh, that I know folks even on the call use uh, that I haven't highlighted here, but you can book me, appointment, you name it, tons of great resources, put yours in the chat to minimize the time it takes to find that open schedule between the two or five people coordinating, trying to get together. Another wonderful way to minimize email. So let's talk about canned responses really quick. What I invite everyone on the call to think about is observing your frequent flyers. What do you find yourself begrudging even when it arrives in your inbox because you've just typed the same thing to somebody else before? All right, so let's go to my inbox and then from there I click the little wheel icon in the upper right or the gear and I drop down and click on settings. And from there I go over to the advanced tab and you can see here that I've enabled already canned responses or also called templates here as a feature. You can also see some of the other recent additions in the advanced Gmail setting that came out earlier this year below that. But from there, let's start a new message. I'll just compose here and highlight uh, how to find the can response. You know, I'll just say I'm selecting my from field, my uh, CCL account, and then it's under more options. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it's can responses. It pops up as an option. So at this point, yeah, like, so you can still say at the top, hello, Amy, thanks for being awesome, you know, and then from there you can go into whatever you want to personalize. So to create one, it's super easy. All right, so then you just go, hello, I'm a canned response. And then say you really want to save that, you can say new canned response, and that's, uh, you know, boring you know and then there you go so now it's right here and boring there you go now you can put multiple borings in there so it's all it, it's it's not very intuitive because you have to save it in the middle section but there's only three functions you insert something you save it or you can delete it now for example i don't like boring anymore so i'm going to get rid of it but what i'd like to kind of highlight with this example is that oftentimes as well being persistent is important um, with emails, again, sometimes we snow people over with length, 
or we assume that one time, you know, a send off is sent and then, you know, if they don't get back to us, they must have hated us. Uh, well, uh, if there anybody, uh, if there's anybody out there again, that's like me, chances are sometimes that's just because you yourself have such a busy inbox, it's hard to keep up. So I really want to empower people to use your judgment, uh, but be aware, especially uh, with some of your communication, uh, not only, you know, I'm thinking even outside of CCL volunteers with this, but with some of your other outreach with community leaders or speakers for your conference, you name it, members of Congress, scheduling uh, for your next meeting, having a chance to be persistent, uh, you know, weekly with polite follow-ups is wonderful. And uh, that's another wonderful way to kind of integrate that. You can also see that this has bracketed hashtags. And what that kind of is hinting at is that if you use a program like GMAS, you can actually personalize the same script to 10 different people and they're gonna see actually an email personalized for themselves with a task that they have, with their own name, uh, with the deadline that might be different for them. It's a wonderful way to kind of have productivity without having to copy and paste everything individually with each email. The last thing I'll just highlight is MailChimp. So we actually have a link here uh, using uh, uploading customized templates and editing them in MailChimp. Again, you can find the uh, CCL template uh, for MailChimp in your account. I'll actually put that in the chat window as well. It's in the group leaders drive. And uh, again, the video below assumes uh, that you've already kind of started with MailChimp. If you'd like to get started, if you haven't already, uh, you know, they offer a free account for up to 2,000 subscribers and uh, 12,000 emails a month. So especially if your chapter is large already and you're bumping into a limit of kind of Gmail thinking you're a spammer, um, you know, uh, MailChimp has been a wonderful tool that a lot of our chapters have used to consolidate emails. And uh, please ask your regional co coordinator or myself to connect you uh, with a group leader that's using MailChimp already in your region if you'd like to find out more. So let me just close with this. A couple, two last slides, uh, reflections from the field and then kind of putting it all together. So here is how some people say they uh, think of or approach email. Like good dental hygiene, there's just no substitute for diligently going through your inbox and deleting, archive, etc. It's like a simple housekeeping ritual. If you stay on top of it, you'll avoid a mess and the, the bill that follows. Uh, treating it like a to-do box and really kind of focusing on that is a wonderful approach. I think I also love the emphasis of just setting healthy boundaries, whatever that is for you, whether it's committing to not doing emails on your phone, uh, so that you really don't kind of have that fall along with wherever you're at, especially on vacation, right? Um, or even setting aside weekend time uh, and making sure that that's special, that isn't interrupted. Uh, oftentimes, CCLers are most busy on weekends, so I know that might be hard um, every weekend, but at least really being emphasizing healthy boundaries and having a, a setup where you can feel like you have breathing space outside of having the, uh, constantly having to manage it. Again, I already said this a little bit earlier, but stop believing in the perfect time unicorn. Uh, their you know, best time really is now. Don't delude yourself into thinking that you'll have more time for email at some point. Uh, stop believing in the siblings better time and more time as well. It's never coming, so don't put things off, uh, they advise, and your future self will have the same time as your current self. So it's about prioritizing, accepting what you deem important enough to actually do right now. And then I'll just lastly close by saying amidst all of this, again, it's really easy and you can still be personalized even in your short, concise responses. And that's obviously most human and right in line with our values as CCLers to be positive and relationship driven. So uh, here's a couple of final thoughts. Applying all of this to our CCL networks. A lot of advice out there from groups that are really effective, you know, that have high production and a lot of activity. Sending emails only to volunteers when necessary was a really important theme that emerged from their feedback. Clustering information together so that that email, if it has a couple of links, you know, is all in one rather than having three or four um, that are immediately sent out and you kind of uh, tap the well, if you will, or cry wolf a bit for people to continue to want to open the sending uh, that you have. There's also even a, um, an app, uh, uh, approach that Gmail has where you can personalize your Gmail inbox uh, from field. 
so that it can show up as a different title. If you, for some of your emails, want it to come from CCL uh, Lexington, for example, and others from, you know, Brett Cease, you could easily customize that. And I'd be happy to show you how to do that. That's in the link in this slide as well. The other emerging uh, theme is to keep emails short and easy to read, going back to that five senses mantra again, and using your subjects effectively. Uh, don't just kind of take uh, for granted that the subject line is often the easiest way that you can really kind of call attention to what the, the purpose of the email is. Even immediately posing the question in the subject line is often effective. Personalizing it, keeping the subject line quote, but indicating what it's for is often a wonderful best practice. Another uh, big theme from the network is only having one call to action or question in your email. I realize that this is in tension with the first point that I just shared, uh, but you can consolidate information, but if you do have multiple calls to action or multiple requests or questions in your email, it often can lead and stymie a response. Uh, people have a harder time juggling, you know, more than one uh, immediate way to respond. And it's also, I think, frustrating for people if they're trying to track threads to know how to merge or handle those in their own filtering and sorting. So here's what I'd like to close with. I would like everyone on the line tonight, again, to not feel overwhelmed by what we just talked about, is think about a plan based on what we talked about tonight that you would like to try out. What would you like to do to reduce your email? And then pilot for a week. Then consider what it will take then to make this pilot become your new reality after you do it for a week. Take notes, write down how you feel before and after, especially what you observe you feel like made you more productive and how you might roll it out with the rest of your CCL team. And I'll just close with this great quote from Sarah in Fairfax. And I think this is a really helpful way, especially when you do feel overwhelmed with emails, to kind of just slow down and think about another way of conceptualizing them. For me, it helps if you don't think of emails as chores that are burdening you, but as messages from people you are genuinely happy to hear from, at least for the most part. I love answering emails from my fellow volunteers because getting them engaged and doing stuff is the whole reason I'm a group leader. Let's face it, worrying about climate change can make you feel awfully lonely. When I'm communicating with another volunteer about our work, I'm not alone. Here's to that, Sarah, and thank you again for everyone that helped create all of the resources highlighted in this webinar. I really hope that uh, this has been helpful 